We're going to talk about how to share memory. If you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about the difference between a process and a thread. And we said a Rust task is sort of like both of those. It is like a thread. It's got its own program counter. It's got its own stack. It's like a process in that it has somewhat isolated memory, but it has a way to do memory sharing that's safe. We have ways to have memory shared, and we've seen using channels as one way to have tasks communicate. There are also provided data abstractions in the Rust library that allow you to have other ways of sharing data between tasks. But they're all safe. They give you a way to do that safely. I'm going to talk about how to implement a counter. So this is something that hopefully all of you have got to in problem set three, that you had to turn the unsafe counter in the provided code into a safe counter. Here's an unsafe counter. So we're using unsafe. We've got a shared static variable, and we are updating it. So what's the value of count at the end of this loop? What's going to be printed out here? I think it's just 10,000. No matter how many times we run it, as long as a cosmic ray doesn't hit our memory and corrupt one of our values while it's running, we're always going to get 10,000. So even though it's unsafe, it actually seems like it's always going to be correct here. And it's correct because we only have one thread running. Everything's going on in one thread. We know the value of count is always going to increase by one every time we call update. And we're calling update 10 times 1,000 times. We needed unsafes there but our code is actually always going to behave the way we expect. Now let's add a spawn. So now we're going to create a separate task to do each of those loops. So we're going to be having 10 tasks. Each one is doing this loop 0 to uh, 999. What do we think this is going to output as the value of count? So let's try compiling this. Last chance to answer what the count is. And I'm willing to give away a, a book or a Rust sticker on loan if you get this correct. Yes. OK, so it might be less than 10,000. How much less? You, you don't get a prize for, you know, you got to get an exact number for a prize, or at least within about 10. OK, good. So it doesn't wait for them to finish. So it might be quite a bit less. It's probably pretty hard to guess what it's going to actually be. If you happen to guess correctly, that would be good. But, and it's going to vary each time. So we're getting 7,000, 6,000 fairly consistently in that range. but. If other things were happening while I was running this, it might be quite different. But maybe that's still a legitimate counter. It's just a problem that we didn't wait until the end. So to see a little more what's going on here, I added a couple prints. So we're going to print a message before and after each update. What do we expect to see when I run it now? OK, so I've compiled it, and now I'm going to run it. So let's scroll back to the top. And that looks pretty sensible, right? So before, so the number after the before is the ID of the task that was spawned. And the number after is the, the value before. So we see before 0, we match up there. We're doing mostly matches. Now we've got a bef after 3, before. How do we like this sequence? So we had after 3, the value is 24. Before 2, it was 24. Before 0, before 3 was 24. Actually, that's OK. Right? We increased three times. We had three tasks running. But we did end up with a value of 9,894 instead of 10,000. So if we look through that more carefully, we're going to find some that didn't work. I will show you from a previous run some of the things we'll see. We could probably find them in this, but I don't want to. Uh, spend the time to look for them now. So here's something we saw. What do we think happened here? So uh, there we go. So there's one that happened here. So this is even better. So what do we think happened here? Yes. OK, good. So the task 5 started to print after 5, 1, 2, 9, 9. Those streams are getting flushed at some point. right? So probably in the middle of flushing that stream, the scheduler switched to running task 7 that started printing its before. And then we see the output for the other print in the middle. So these streams are not synchronized. We can have think task switching in the middle of those streams. We ended up with the wrong count. So that maybe isn't that surprising that we could have a task switch in the middle of printing, because printing's pretty slow and expensive. How could we end up with the wrong count? So we ended up with 
instead of 10,000, we ended up with 9,894. Uh, 9, so we lost about, a, a, we lost 106 counts. How, how, how are we losing counts? Good, yeah. So even this update is not atomic. It looks like this instruction, we're just looking at the level of the source code. Well, that's one instruction. It seems like either that happens or it doesn't. And if it happens, it adds one to count. If it doesn't happen, it didn't yet, it happened. What does that instruction end up looking like after we compile it? How many instructions do you think that compiles to? Yes. OK, good. I think you may be exactly right, depending on where we count. Right, so what are the three instructions? OK, good. You answered a practical question, so I don't know if you need more theory education or not, but uh, you can have, if you feel like you're too advanced for my theory book, you can give it to someone more needy. We can see that. If you compile with the dash capital S, you'll get to see the assembly code in a file. This is the code that is generated here. We're in the update count procedure. There's a lot of hash code added to the names here, which I think with the right flags, you can probably prevent to allow it to link to C code. All of this stuff that we're seeing, this is just setting up the call stack, doing the calling convention. The interesting part is in here. We are loading from memory this count value, loading it into our AX. We're adding one to it, and then we're moving it back. If there is another thread that between the time this instruction happens and that one finishes, we could have another thread that reads the old counter value, does its add one, and updates it, and miss a count. This isn't that rare. Right? We saw that running that loop, it happened about 1% of the time. Instead of getting 10,000, we got 9,800 something. So, so this certainly happens. What if I compile with dash O? This is the result. I've compiled the same source code, now using optimizations. I'm showing you the assembly code. Are we happier with this? Do you think we can still get an output of 6672? It's not adding one anymore. It's adding 1,000. So it actually figured out how to unroll that loop and figure out that the, the net effect of all that inline the update count is to add 1,000. Now we're always going to get some multiple of 1,000. Do you think we're always going to get 10,000? So we got 10,000 the first several times I run it. Are we always going to get 10,000? It still might be the case that these haven't finished before we get to the print. I did manage to get 9,000. This is one of the kinds of things that should worry you a little bit. Because it's unsafe code, we can't really assume too much about the behavior. But the fact that the behavior is so different when you have compiler optimizations on instead of when they're off is something that is important to understand. People think of compiler optimizations as just making code faster. When the behavior is not precisely defined, it makes it behave quite differently. Now we're going to talk about how to make it safe. The data abstraction that Rust provides, there's several ARCs. And ARC stands for automatically reference counted. We talked about reference counting a few classes ago. This means that the data structure itself is keeping track of how many references there are to it. Why is that important if we want to have shared mutable state? What do we need to know about the other references to this, this object? So when we talked about reference counting, it was for automatic memory management. We talked about this being a way to get hyper-incremental garbage collection, where each object keeps track of whether it's garbage or not by counting the number of references to it. So that's partly what we could use reference counting for. Here we're also using it to provide a way to share mutable state that's safe. And that means in order for the state to be shared safely, we need to know that there's no other thread doing something unsafe with it when this thread is doing something with it. And there are different kinds of arcs provided in the library. So the one that we're going to focus on today is, is the RW arc. So there, there are two kinds of arcs that are provided by this library. One is a mutex that gives you mutual exclusion. So with a mutex, if someone holds the lock on that object, no one else can be using it. No other thread can be using that object while the lock is held. The other kind of arc is an RW arc. This stands for read write, where we have shared mutable state that's protected by a lock that is different for reading and writing. So we can either lock it for reading or lock it for writing. Why might we want to have different locks for reading and writing, or treat things differently if we want to read that storage versus if we want to write to it? Yeah, good. Right, so the reason we want to have different locks for reading and writing, we can have as many readers as we want. So we have many threads holding the reader lock, being able to read this object at the same time. 
They don't have to wait for, for the other threads to stop reading it, as long as no one's writing it. We can only have one writing it. And once we have one writing it, then no one else can be reading it. Right? So if you hold the writer lock, no other thread can be either reading or writing that object. But if you have the reader lock, it's OK to have others also reading. So this gives us more concurrency than if we had a mutex, where once you hold the lock, whether you're reading or writing, every other thread that needs that object has to wait. The way to create RWARC, we can use new. So I'm going to create one for our counter using an integer. And we'll start it with value 0. To do a write on an RWARC means I'm going to be holding the write lock while this code is running. Write takes an RWARC object, and then it takes the code that I'm going to run. So this is a function that takes as its input. What does that mean? What's the input to the function that runs in the write? If I create my RWARC where t is an int, so that's what's matching up as the type parameter, this is going to be a mutable reference to that type. What we're passing in is a reference to the object that's wrapped in the arc. That means I can modify the value of that integer inside the, the wrapped arc. So this is the way we're going to do update counter. We're calling counter write. This is the function we're passing in. It takes one input. So what is the type of count? Is it an int? So it's not an int. It's given by that. So the type of count is it's a mutable reference to an int. That's why we need the start. This will modify the value of count in a safe way. While that code is executing, no other thread can be doing anything with this RWARC object. I've modified my counter code. So I have my new counter code. I need this clone because I can't move that reference into the spawn process because I want to use it again. This one I think I really don't need, but the Rust runtime was crashing when I run it without that. That's kind of unfortunate that you don't really want to be making unnecessary clones. And what clone is doing is, is it is cloning the RWARC but the object that is inside it is shared among all the, the clones of the RWRC. It's not cloning what's inside it. So we still have copies of that. And when we run this, what do we think we're going to get as the output? Still don't know, because although it's safe, we're not going to have any of these problems of not increasing the count. We still don't have any guarantee that all the spawns finish before we get to here. We actually get outputs like this. Before, we were getting like 6,000, 7,000. Why are we getting only 1,000 now? Yes. Yeah. So it's taking longer to run. The work to do each update count now has the work of actually grabbing that lock. So that takes time. There's more likelihood that some other task will run, but it's also taking longer. All of these spawn processes are making progress much less quickly than they were before. So it's more likely that by the time we get to here, the count has only increased by, by about 1,000. This is an experimental result. Like We can't make a strong claim about how long it's going to take, but it gives you some indication of the runtime cost. Where does the runtime cost come from? Why is it taking longer? So some of it is the extra work of you've got a lot of code to grab the lock. What's the other reason it's slower? So what happens if when one thread is trying to grab the lock, another thread is, is in here? What's the point of the RW arc? What is it doing for us? So our goal here is to have shared mutable storage, but shared in a predictable way, where the behavior of our code isn't going to suffer from things like having the thread switching between the time when I loaded that value in a register and the time when I actually wrote it and missing, missing a count because of it. What write is doing, if the lock's not available, so it's locking it in write mode, if the lock's not available, it's blocked. The write will be stuck and waiting until that lock is available. So if we have multiple threads trying to write the same object, well, they can't proceed as quickly as they could without the lock because they have to wait until each one finishes. Right? We no longer have concurrency there. Each thread has to wait for the other one to finish, give the lock back before it can go. In this case, you know, it's, it's very fine-grained concurrency, because the lock is only being held for the length of executing this. But the lock is being held and blocking all the other threads from making progress if they need the lock on that RWR. If I want this to actually work correctly, I need to wait until all of the spawn tasks are done. I can do that by using another RWARC that counts the number that are running. This is probably not the best way to do it, but it works. So we're going to create another RWARC. This one, we're going to add one to each time we go through this loop, and we're going to subtract when we get to the end of that. So now that's counting the number of tasks that are running. Before we get to the print at the end, we're doing this. What is this doing? 
Okay, good. The test condition for loop is it's reading the value that's stored in that RWR. Right? And if that value is greater than zero, the loop's continuing. The value of the read is, is the value of that expression, which is the value that we read. If it's greater than zero, that means there are tasks still running and we have to keep waiting. Because it's an RWR, if we had multiple readers, they could all keep going. Does this lock out the writers? So can we have one thread inside a write and another one inside a read at the same time? That's pretty unsafe. Right, if we had one thread reading and one thread writing, well, it's possible that this read could happen in the middle of this write, where the value there might be in some inconsistent state. So it still does lock out the writers. Right? We can have many readers at once. Once we have one writer, we can't have anything else.